All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thank you yet again to the extraordinary uh, student leaders of our ACS chapter uh, for putting on yet another fantastic event. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be associated with the Duke ACS chapter, and it is especially a great honor to be introducing today's speaker, Sue Bell Cobb, uh, former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Cobb served for three decades as a judge in Alabama, eventually becoming, in 2007, the first female Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. She served until 2011 and has remained quite busy since then. Um, just authored a recent book on child advocacy, hopefully forthcoming uh, from the new press in two weeks. Uh, we'll find out. Um, um, but she's also written uh, for popular press um, some articles which uh, you may have read, and if not, I recommend. One was a piece last spring in Politico magazine, which is available online, and it's absolutely fantastic um, about topics, some of which she'll address today, on how um, basically campaigns are ruining state judges and state courts. Um, and for those of you who had me or heard me talk about, talk about clerkships, you know how much state courts mean to me, um, so this topic is very close to, my, uh, close to my heart. The penultimate line of that article is, uh, judges are not and should never be like ordinary politicians. We cannot and should not promise anything for those who elect us, but to be fair. Uh, it's a fantastic line, fantastic article. I recommend it to you. Um, and uh, before, actually, the justice starts her lecture, we're going to watch a campaign ad. Um, we've got queued up here on YouTube, and then I will step out of the way. Her faith, her family, shine brighter every day. This little light of mine. She graduated at the top of her class and with honors from law school and became Judge Sue Bell Cobb, a pioneer for women judges in Alabama history. She put thousands of criminals in jail. Her house was firebombed, but Judge Sue Bell Cobb only grew stronger, more determined. She served 40 counties, and today Judge Sue Bell Cobb decides life and death. While all those years outside the courtroom, Judge Sue Bell Cobb became a state and national leader, a reformer helping children stay out of jail. A southern woman, kind and caring, strong and determined. Judge Sue Bell Cobb is everything our Chief Justice should be. I am Sue Bell Cobb, and it is an honor to be here at Duke. It is an honor to be here at Duke. I told some I'm of Judge your Sue Bell Cobb, fellow students. And I'm the only candidate. <laughs> you think we can turn it off? He's on it. He's on it. That would be another Sue Bell Cobb ad. <laughs> but we're not going to listen to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, that ad, we raised some money the entire time that I, the first few months of my running for Chief Justice. Having been a trial judge for 13 and a half years, I tried cases in 40 of Alabama's 67 counties. I was elected, the first woman elected, to the Court of Criminal Appeals in Alabama. I served 12 years on the Court of Criminal Appeals. I've been an outspoken, unfettered advocate for children, involved greatly in major reform efforts uh, to help the least, the last, and the lost. And um, Judge Roy Moore uh, was the present Chief Justice of Alabama. And at that time, I decided that I would run. Uh, and I was basically making the decision to run uh, at the end of my term, which in Alabama you have a free ride to be able to ride, be able to not resign your job, you can run for another judicial position. So I made the decision to run. So I'm now raising some money. I raised money. I was, it was difficult because no one thought that a Democrat could win in Alabama, and um, pretty much um, Republicans because we have Alabama's one of seven states that still has partisan election of judges. Um, people didn't think it was possible. I was running against a Republican incumbent who had replaced Chief Justice Moore when he was removed by the Judicial Inquiry Commission because of his refusal to remove the monument that he had placed in the courthouse, in the judicial building. So I'm running. I raise uh, several hundred thousand dollars and put it on that ad. Meet Sue Bell Cobb. Would that ad, do you think that ad would help improve the image of the judiciary? 
positive, uplifting, yes? Well, I'm now going around, and I'm going, judges are taking me through courthouses, I'm going from courthouse to courthouse, uh, asking for support from lawyers, from people in the courthouses everywhere. And I walk up to the Walker County Courthouse, which is a courthouse in kind of the northern third of the, of the state. And there's a gentleman, an elderly uh, man that's outside the Walker County Courthouse. And I go up to him and say, sir, I'm Sue Bell Cobb. I'm on the Court of Criminal Appeals. I'm running to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Alabama. And he said, you're Sue Bell Cobb? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, you know, I've seen those ads of yours on the, on the television. I said, yes, sir. And he said, I've got just one question for you. Now, what is typically that one question that kind of special interest groups make sure that you're asked when you're out in public if you're a judge or really running for almost anything? What are some of those questions that you're asked? Republican or Democrat, that's one. Judicial activist, that's sort of, kind of. You might be asked that. What would you do if you were elected? What about your position on the death penalty? What's your position on the Second Amendment? What's your position on prayer in schools? All of which I think are totally inappropriate for a judge to answer those questions because your personal position, if and when you follow the law, it's really totally irrelevant. Instead of asking me any of those questions, he said, I've got just one question for you. And I said, yes, sir, what's that question? He said, do you really play the piano at church? <laughs> I said, yes, sir, I do. And I have for many years. And he said, that's all I wanted to know. Now, do y'all think that you think that he believed that you had to play the piano at church to be a good chief justice? No. What was he asking me? Really, what was he asking me? Did y'all hear what she said? He wanted to know, was I the person I was portraying myself to be? He wanted to know, was I telling the truth? How many ads now can we really be convinced to tell the truth? I was able to say to him, yes, sir, I do play the piano at church, but I've done lots of other things as well. And at that time, had been a judge for 25 years and, um, you know, later went on to talk about my credentials that I think truly qualified me to be a judge, a justice on the Supreme Court of Alabama and the Chief Justice of that Supreme Court. Um, so I tell that story because it's very important. Very important to know that your judges are telling the truth and are who you, th who you think they are. Because all we have, all we have is people's respect for us. That's all the courts have. The courts don't have the power of the purse, like the legislative branch. They don't have uh, an army, like the executive branch. All we have is the respect to the people. Um, so, you know, as I, you know, now I'm running, I've, I raised $2.6 million. I went up against a Republican incumbent who was a very nice man, a very, very nice man. Um, and that year, he, he reported $5.5 million, and outside interest groups raised another three that aren't included in the numbers. As a result, our race for Chief Justice, I ran in the most expensive judicial race in the United States of America in 2006, and it remains the second most expensive race in history of the United States of America. During three, legislat three um, political cycles, 2002, 2004, and 2006, the, during that period of time, justices and judges in the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court of the state of California, eight times as large. Who's from California? I know I met somebody. Yes, several. 
eight, eight, eight and a half times larger than Alabama, probably. So you probably got, do y'all know how many appellate judges? I'm going to say 100, but it, it's a bunch, right? So Alabama has 19. During those three election cycles, California has merit selection with vote of retention. How much money was spent on all judicial races in the state of California those three election cycles in order to retain or not retain the judges and justices that sit on the appellate bench in California? Anybody want to hazard a guess? I mean, with 40 million people, 35, 35 something like that? Um, how much money was spent? Anybody know? Ten million. Ten million? I, th I think that's a good guess. Three, three legislative cycle, three election cycles. Two hundred and seventy thousand dollars, which is basically a trial court race in Alabama, and probably here uh, in Durham in this county as well. Anybody want to hazard a guess how much was spent in Alabama with partisan election of judges? During those three election cycles, around $30 million. The studies have shown that people have less, um, think less of the courts in states where there has been uh, a lot of money spent on ads, the studies show. All right, so I've had the race. I was fortunate and blessed. Uh, to be given the opportunity after 25 years of serving and growing up in the courts because I became a judge at 25. I grew up in the courts, um, one of the guys, literally, and um, was able to then serve. And, but right after the election, my family had made so many sacrifices, it's impossible to even quantify the sacrifices that my family made during those two years. I've got a three-year, three and four-year, three-year, three-year-old who turned four. I've got the docket that I'm holding and handling on the Court of Criminal Appeals, one of the highest cases per judge dockets in the nation. And then I'm running a very expensive and hard-fought race for the Supreme Court. So I don't know what I'm doing the day before the election or even election day, but I know what I'm doing two days after the election. I'm going, I'm showing up at my daughter's school, and I'm taking her win, lose, or draw on a field trip. It's a field trip. And I knew that at least two days after the election and before I'd taken office, I'd have time. So I show up in the Suburban ready for the field trip, and I look at one of the moms and say, where are we going? And she says, I don't know. I just signed up to come. And I said, well, me too. I didn't have a clue. <laughs> And so here I am, and we turn around, and all of a sudden they give us directions to a Confederate battlefield, which some of you may have gone to Confederate battlefields. I had not done that. Uh, I had read Confederates in the Attic, which was an interesting portrayal of someone who was looking at the reenactment, the culture of reenactors and things of that nature, but I'd never been. So now we're there with the kids. Moms are kind of taking the you know, back seat, of course. We go to the medicine tent. We go to the ammunition tent. You've got all the, the authentic reenactors kind of doing all this educational effort. And um, right about that time, my, phone, my cell phone rings. And so I, I step back very quickly. I step back, and I say, Sue Bell Cobb. And it's a reporter from the National Law Journal said, Judge, Judge Cobb, I understood from your office that I might could just have a moment with you. I said, well, I'm at my daughter's field trip. It would, could only be a moment. And I'm thinking, you know, she's fixing to ask me, what does it feel like to be the first female Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? She's about to ask me, what does it feel like to be the first juvenile judge ever elected to the Supreme Court? Or she's going to ask me, what does it feel like to have more diverse experience and more years of experience before you're elected Chief Justice than anyone who'd served in the past 80 years, if not forever. Her question was, Chief Justice Cobb, I mean Judge, Judge Cobb, how does it feel to be the victor of the most expensive judicial race in the nation? And right then, the cannon went off. 
And I look up to heaven, and I hope nobody takes offense at this. I look up to heaven and say, Dear Lord, please do not let that Yankee ask me where I am. (laughs) Please. And she didn't. Another prayer answered, just like I want it. What's my point? People say, what did you say? And I said, I think the people of Alabama Alabama know me well enough that I'm going to do the right thing regardless, no matter what. But that is one of the reasons why since my retirement um, that I am convinced that this is an area where we have got to educate not just lawyers but citizens of the importance of making sure that we select judges in a way that will support make sure that we have judges that know how and have the traits and characteristics that will enable them to be good judges. Why? Because judges make the decisions that are the the most important in people's lives. They decide whether you keep your children or lose them. They decide whether they keep your, your house or lose it, your business or lose it, your money, your freedom. They even decide in a number of states, whether you live or die. So if ever we need fine people with strong internal moral compasses that care more about doing what's right than the possible result on the next election, it's in the judiciary. It's in the judiciary. So I am honored to be a representative and a member of the American Constitution Society because they have made a priority this issue. And this issue is something that's got to to flow out of just the borders of the bench and the bar. It has got to become an issue that's grasped by everyone. Now, any questions? Because this is going to be a mighty short program if there's not questions. Any questions? Who's going to be brave enough to ask one? Um, yes. So what's the trend right now? Are there more uh, judges being elected, less judges being elected? Is there like a push to have it more of a merit-based system? <coughs> what's the current situation? The, the trends are that we're not seeing as much change in the six or seven states <coughs> that are pretty much red states. and um, But not all of them are red because Pennsylvania, uh, it's, I can, for instance, Pennsylvania, Texas, Alabama, Illinois, um, we're not seeing much movement in the states that have the systems of partisan election of judges. Unfortunately, what we are seeing is that even in merit selection with votive retention, we're seeing the money grow. We're seeing the amounts of money increase so that special interest groups and others are crossing over borders and um, trying to pick out controversial decisions. I was fortunate enough to meet a gentleman from Iowa, and there he is, and we talked about um, his, um, the Chief Justice, who's a dear friend of mine, um, she's now former Chief Justice, Marsha Turnus. Can you speak loud enough to tell him what happened in Iowa? Yeah, sure. Uh, in, I think it was 2009, right? The Iowa Supreme Court unanimously overturned the ban on uh, gay marriage in the state of Iowa, and the next year, uh, three of those justices, including the Chief Justice, were up for the retention election, and interest groups worked to vote them out, and they were voted out. They were all voted out. Um, they later received the Profile and Courage Award from the Kennedy um, Award, um, but they were voted out by applying the law of the state of Iowa, which was the state of Iowa had an equal protection clause, and they uh, unanimously uh, overturned the law. Out-of-state group comes in and spends about one point, I'm in the area of 1.6 million, and um, and then they, um, the the bar's not ready, nobody's really ready to respond, and the result was all three were voted out. Since that time, one of the justices has come up, and he was retained because the bar got ready. So even in... Nonpartisan races, we see, like the state of Georgia, 
uh, they have a nonpartisan elections, the money is increasing. In the retention votes for merit selection, the money is increasing, which is why the American Constitution Society has wisely determined that this is an increasingly important issue. If you care about the law, if you care about people, if you care about what our country stands for, it's increasingly important. Next question. Anybody? Yes, let's see. Let's go right here. Um, I guess I'm surprised that so much money is going in. I had no idea. Why are people willing to bankroll so much of these elections? I, forgive me for being indelicate, but it doesn't seem like a chief justice position would be that financially lucrative, that you can bankroll that much money. What happened in Alabama and in other states was that um, the business community was very disturbed at plaintiff's verdicts. You know, back in the 80s, 90s, they became increasingly uh, concerned about plaintiff's verdicts. And as a result, the legislatures came in and pretty much legislature to legislature, they passed tort reform. Y'all understand what that entails, tort reform. And a lot of the Supreme Courts overturned it um, because of problems in it. They thought that it invaded the right to jury trial, and there's other, other legal theories upon which, um, depending on how it was written, that they believe that it did not um, comport with the, their state constitution or others. And so that's when the business community in Alabama, Alabama became the first state that Carl Rove, and are y'all familiar with Carl Rove? Al Alabama was the first state um, that Carl Rove came to and basically said, if y'all will give me the money, I will change your court. In the back. So you have been a juvenile judge. You've dealt with family matters and criminal law. So a lot of those problems um, are dealing, stem from poverty. Um, and lack of access to resources, be they jobs, mental health, you know, all kinds of different things here, and then violence that sometimes is more likely to arise from the pressures in those situations. Has there been any discussion um, within judicial races or other ones, if, if so, um, with rerouting that money that's being used to win elections to instead address some of the root causes that? you know, are the reasons why people often end up find themselves in the judicial system. Surely that's an aspiration and a dream of people who believe like you and I do, um, that the least, the last, and the lost are where we need to be focused, that if we provided appropriate services um, for individuals that haven't had the opportunities that, that y'all have had and that I had, that we'd have a different city, county, state, and nation. Um, but the any of those changes would have to percolate and then pass through the legislature. And it is very hard to find, um, after folks have given tons of campaign contributions to legislators, to get them to vote uh, just for uh, those kind of issues that you and I believe so strongly, so strongly in. Um, there's, there's discussions all the way around, you know, because it's not just judicial races where uh, campaign money has had such a big effect. We certainly hear it every single day in the presidential race, do we not? Um, and it's that with judges, we know that people think less and begin to basically compare us and don't see a difference between legislators or other politicians when you have money in judicial races. Um, but I'm not sure if I absolutely answered your question, but we've got to get um, the lobbying effort, the dollars there, plus a grassroots effort uh, organized to be able to change it. Um, the Citizens United case and the, the fact that uh, campaign finance um, reform has really taken such a, you know, such a terrible decline, you know, as a result of Citizens United. Um, there's all things that we just need to be concerned about and continually talk about so that we make a better uh, case that people can really grasp how important you know, these issues are. Yes, sir. So when I vote in California, which is not a partisan election, obviously, 
what do you recommend doing to decide who to vote for? Because I usually, honestly, I just skip the judges because I have no clue. The California judges. has had in the past, and I think still has, a voter guide. This is something that people could sponsor uh, legislation, and this is, I'm glad you asked the question because this is one of the things that I think we could do right now. Because with the internet, you're talking about not nearly as much money being able to disseminate it, um, but it still needs to be funded, where you literally could have a voter information guide on judges uh, as well as other elected officials. The states that have voter guides that can educate the citizenry, please, please go to these guides. If you're not sure, um, please go to these guides so that you can see the years of experience, you can see what their concerns are. Um, it, it would make a difference. Because right now, people are doing just what you said. I mean, they're not voting because they don't know. And we've got, you know, if you can't, if we can't get merit selection with voter retention, even then you still need the voter guides because you need to say yes, vote, retain them, or no, don't. You know, um, but that's a, that's a huge thing that we could do that local bar associations, um, the state bar associations could get behind uh, to try to pass through the legislature. And it should have a, a smaller fiscal note you know, and, and it shouldn't be as controversial, you know, as some other matters. Now, there was somebody in the back. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a less serious question, but I'm curious what it's like being a 25-year-old judge because at Duke, I, I may have missed the Career Center lunch talk about how to be a judge straight out of law school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it is, uh, I, I think you could e easily say it's an anomaly, that's for sure. Um, I graduated from law school in 1981. And during that time, uh, five years before that, we had a phenomenal chief justice named Howell Heflin. Y'all may not know Howell Heflin, but he later became our U.S. senator, which was amazing considering when he was able to get the legislature to pass the judicial article, which reformed at least the judicial side of uh, our government in Alabama, he unified our court system and did away with non-lawyer judges. In the state of New York, you still have non-lawyer judges. In many, many states, you still have judges that do not have law degrees. Out west, there's a number of states that uh, have judges that are justices of the peace. They're making decisions on juvenile cases. They're making decisions on DUIs. They're making decisions on misdemeanor marijuana possession. Um, they're making important decisions and they don't have law degrees. In Alabama, we did away with them in 1975. The gentleman, then they were elected, um, was partisan election, um, and then they were elected. And when they did, the gentleman that had my, in my home county, that position of the district judge in Conecuh County that handled all juvenile work and everything else that a circuit judge who had jury trial responsibilities um, would like for someone else to handle. Um, they, they created that court. He stepped down because the, the pay for those ju for judges was very low. After I was at, in law school three years at Alabama, that position remained vacant for three years. Um, judges from the nor the, each county on each side came in each, each day. One of them would take one day in order to do what needed to be done in that county. So we got by. But people would move into the county. They would um, try to um, they satisfy the year residency. They had a law degree. They couldn't get a job somewhere else. They came to Conecuh County and um, tried to get that judgeship. So there were numbers of people that had moved in, or several people that had moved in. I was able literally to come back, a little Miss Valedictorian, you know, little Miss um, soloist in the church choir, um, played piano, you know, played piano again, piano. Uh, it goes back, <laughs> a, you know, and little Miss everything in Conecuh County and say, I want to come back home and serve the people of my county. And I was able to get the governor to appoint me, and I became a judge three weeks after I had received my law degree. Now, <laughs> do I advocate that? Does anybody think I advocate that? No, no, no. In fact, I supported a bill. A legislator very, you know, tentatively came to me and said, Chief, I don't want this to be an insult to you, but I'm offering a bill for practice requirements. And I said, I'm with you. I'm with you, totally. Um, when I became a judge in a uh, limited jurisdiction court, uh, 
I, I traveled and I had had experience during law school um, that enabled me to do the job with clerkships and other things. But I also um, traveled from county to county and said, tell me how you do it, give me your forms. I sat through their courts. You know, I basically just did a have robo travel. Then I continued that because I was from a rural area and I then offered myself to be appointed when cases where there was recusals, where a judge stepped down, where a judge was sick, where a judge was removed. And so that was why in many, many counties I was the first woman ever, sometimes would still be the only woman, to have served as a judge in those counties where I did a little bit of everything. I did um, a, lots of civil work. I did lots of divorces. I did lot, just a wide variety of uh, jury trials and just lots of different things. And it just helped me be a better job. And I use that as advice, particularly to law students, because do y'all think I got paid extra to do that? No. Was it a whole lot more work? A whole lot more work. But it's the things that you don't get paid for are really the things that really matter. Just like many of you will go to large law firms, it's going to be that pro bono case that stays with you forever that you do. Please, please go out and register uh, and offer yourself to be a pro bono lawyer. And if you have to become an expert in divorce law, eviction law, uh, you know, other um, the defense in terms of, you know, um, any of the... Uh, credit issues, consumer issues. It'll make you a better lawyer. It'll make you a better person. Next question. Yes, sir. You, you kind of compared um, the partisan elections to California's <coughs> nonpartisan retention election, but to what extent do those, do those partisan election problems still appear in a jurisdiction that has a nonpartisan election that's not a retention election, where you actually those have... Issues, where those issues cross over? Mm -hmm. It's increasing. That's what I'm saying. For instance, in Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin is technically nonpartisan, but it has become very partisan, and the money has continued to increase. The state of Georgia, it's nonpartisan. But if you talk to the justices now, J Justice Carol Hunstein, who was CJ, um, if you talk to former Chief Justice of the Georgia Court, Leah Sears Ward, she can tell you that the money has started to elevate. But the difference is, is that the bar, both on the defense side, and I mean civil case defense side, plus the plaintiff side, has gotten together and said, we don't want what happened in Alabama to happen in Georgia. We need judges who are moderates and who have extensive, extensive experience. What has happened uh, is that a lot of the judges who are elected do not have that depth of experience. I mean, we literally have law clerks being elected. And that's fine, and they're real smart. Um, but I just submit that being in a courtroom, seeing their faces, feeling it, smelling it, hearing it, it makes a big difference when you're reading that flat record, that black and white, the documents, so that you can actually understand what's going on in that courtroom. Because nobody's guaranteed a perfect trial. There's, there's not perfection. But we are guaranteed a fair trial. Let me submit to y'all, please read Professor Joanna Shepard, and if y'all can have another speaker and get ACS to send her. Professor Joanna Shepard from Emory Law School has done extensive research on looking at decisions in criminal cases in states where the money has been escalating. I don't know if y'all have read it, read her work. What she has discovered is that in the states that have larger amounts of money that are spent, the decisions in favor of criminal defendants has gone down. Now, why do y'all think that would be? Anybody? Yes, sir. Here we, he said conviction rates look good. You know, it's it, some of those people have the philosophy, well, they may not have done this, but they've done something. Let's find them guilty, right? You know. Um, these ads, I could show, we could spend all day looking at the ads. Um, look up an ad on, on Judge Kilbride. 
uh, in Illinois. Illinois is one of the states. His race was the, the, the most expensive race in the United States of America. And there was an ad run against him that his elderly parents had to sit and watch over and over and over again. That was about, a, you know, somebody he let out of jail. And, um, you know, not everybody needs to be in jail forever, but nor does, do judges have crystal balls. I wish, believe me, many, many times, I wish I did. Because I'd look at a lawyer and I'd say, and they say, well, Judge, um, we rest. Judge, we rest. And I go, anything else? And then I look at the other side. Anything else? Because I simply hadn't been given. Sometimes it's because they just didn't have it. It wasn't there. Lots of folks have got good claims or good defenses. And it's hard to prove it. Knowing it and proving it are two different things, two different concepts. But you really want more. So you, you know, you would know who to believe. You know, when, you're, when you have bench trials, you're assessing every moment who is telling the truth. Or better yet, who is lying the least. You know, and that's what you got to make your decision on. I told people, having been a trial judge for 13 and a half years, I told people, you, honey, you can call me names, but do not lie to me. Because everything that I was supposed to do was dependent on my ability in bench trials in order to tell who was telling the truth, who was biased, and you know, who was not. Other questions? I'm Joanna Shepard. Yes, sir. Um, so, um, I'm convinced that um, with millions and millions of dollars going into a campaign for judgeship, um, that, that, that raises a serious issue. Um, but there's something about the kinds of campaigns for me that, doesn't, that don't seem to be exactly different than when you also gave your story about how you said, you know, right after law school, you had a set of qualities that qualified you to be appointed, right? Um, that the p local people thought. Right. The, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the governor. Right. So then the question for me is, is the elemental issue that it's the loads of money that have to go into a campaign, or is it the fact that you have to campaign, right? Is it, you see what I'm saying? I do, and it, honestly, I think I'm, campaigning is really a good thing. You know, you could literally tell when I was at Chief Justice's meetings who was appointed and who was not, because they never said anything to you in the elevator, <laughs> you know? You could tell the judges that actually campaigned in that because they were used to, they like it m more extroverted, they like people. It's really a good thing to be out with the people so they can tell you. Because so many of us live in the neighborhoods where we, and that's what I tell people that when I became a judge, that's when I saw five-year-olds with oral and rectal gonorrhea. It's when I had nine-year-olds with their backs stripped of flesh from extension cords. It's when I saw women come in front of me and beg me not to uh, jail their significant other who had basically rearranged their face because they didn't have child care. And now they're going to lose their job because he's in jail and he may be sorry, but he's at least halfway keeping up with the kids. It was, it was in the courtroom when I put on that robe that I actually saw drug abuse, mental health issues, things that so many of us, all, the, all these issues can permeate every level of society, but those people who are poor have much fewer funds to be able to help with those issues. So the campaigning is not a negative thing. But to ask for money, ask a practicing lawyer who practices in your court, hello, hey, it's Judge Cobb. Hey, Judge, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, listen, I, oh, I hear you're running. I'm so excited. You are going to do a fantastic job as Chief Justice. Well, I appreciate it because, you know, I really care about the courts and I want uh, to take my trial court experience uh, to the courts and I want to be able to bring about as much change to the system as it can helpfully withstand. I don't even know if that's correct grammar. And, um, and I said, I sure do need your help. Well, you know I'll do anything in the world to help you, anything in the world. And I said, well, I appreciate it. Do you mind if I... I put my finance director on. So I imposed a personal ban in Alabama, even though we don't have a ban 
in Alabama that I didn't personally ask for money. Then I'd hand the finance director. My finance director, Ben Gaines, a great guy, um, he said, hey, so-and-so, and I appreciate you, you know, willingness to support the chief, and how, how much could you give? And they'd say, man, I really want to help, but I got five cases right now that are up on appeal, and we can't get them resolved. They believe that the court's going to obviously go in their favor and not mine, and I don't have any money. I called it in my article, and I have offended people because of it, but I believe it is true. When you uh, judges are asking people, lawyers particularly, for money, it's like legalized extortion. Because to be perfectly frank, you would be signing a death sentence to your career to not contribute to the sitting judge in your area. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't expect any lawyer to be that brave. I just don't. Um, nor, as Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said, that it would take, she said, it would take a saint for a judge to completely forget and not be impacted by significant contributions. And unfortunately, judges are not saints. So you're asking, the public believes the money matters. Lawyers are polled. They believe that the money matters. And I can tell you that there are times that I've certainly, uh, in my appellate court work, believed, um, not, not all the time by any stretch, not every case, not most of the cases, but there were times that I was very much concerned that who brought them to the court mattered. Anthony Ray Hinton. Has anybody ever heard of Anthony Ray Hinton? Anthony Ray Hinton is probably one of the finest human beings I've ever met or I've ever been on a panel with. I commend him to you. Anthony Ray Hinton served 30 years on death row. And Good Friday, this, this Good Friday, one year will be one year that he walked out of Holman Prison in death row in Alabama, having served 30 years on death row for a crime he did not commit. My dissent... In 2006, when I was running for Chief Justice, where I wrote, if ever a man was not guilty, it is Anthony Ray Hinton. Alibi witnesses that could not be biased. Physical logistics of where he worked and where the crime was committed simply were, I mean, it, he would have to do the beam me up Scotty you know, to actually be there, you know. And I was the only judge who, out of, nine, of, out of uh, 14, the Court of Criminal Appeals and then, uh, then the Supreme Court, that believed that he should get a new trial and that he should be you know, found not guilty. Um, would it have mattered if we had not had such expensive judicial races in Alabama, I believe that it would have. I believe that it would have. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. It's an interesting point, because I work uh, with the Wrongful Convictions Clinic here at Duke, and we ha recently had an exoneration. But one of the problems that Can y'all hear her? Uh, so we recently had an exoneration, but one of the problems that we come up against often when we try and take our case to court is a lot of judges are reluctant to be involved in cases. Like, even when the evidence is clear and we're able to lay it all out, uh, in the case that just had the recantation, the judge who finally gave us the hearing recused himself because he didn't want to be the judge seen to be uh, repealing a conviction. Is that something that you find with elected judges? Well, that's clearly what Professor Shepard has found, is that the decisions in favor of criminal defendants has declined as the campaign contributions and the ability to run that big, horrible ad, you know, kind of the Willie Horton ad, um, that's, as those, that has gone up, absolutely. And it's, it's a concern because, first of all, you know, the United States of America has 5% has of the world's population and 25% and of the people behind bars. There, we've got to finally, you know, come to terms with why that is why we are just totally, uh, you know, we are incarcerating people 
that shouldn't be incarcerated and we're incarcerating people for way too long. You had a question. Yeah, uh, how do the proponents of judicial elections characterize the benefits of it? And is there like a unified uh, force behind it or is it just a lot of small donors going to individual campaigns? How do those that are for are, judicial elections? Are for yeah. judicial elections. Judicial elections were, came about as a reform because at one point all the judges in the United States were were appointed. You know, they were appointed by the king and then they were appointed by the governor uh, and they basically, there was a perception that they just did whatever the king or the governor, you know, wanted. And um, the, so it came about as a reform during um, President Jackson's, you know, presidency. N now, what we see is the, you know, the money. Because historically, y'all, people didn't, people didn't run against judges. There was a judge that was there. It was highly, highly unusual uh, for, uh, for lawyers to run against judges. Um, I brought, it was, it, this is also in the documentary that Skewed Justice that ACS has on their website. I brought, if y'all want to see it later, my first campaign report of finances um, when I ran for the district judgeship in 1982. The total amount spent was, this doesn't have the total, this is one of the reports, was about $2,500. Um, but the guy that ran against me had moved into the county to, to get the position and didn't get it. So you can kind of understand why he would run. But for all through the 80s, for sure, it was just not typical for people, for judge, you know, for lawyers to run. So then when they started running, um, and as the tide turned politically uh, and winning, and the, the money for the salaries increased, lots of folks started running. And the money started increasing. So the proponents of it would say to you that being known as a Democrat means you're liberal, and being, you know, a candidate on the Republican side means you're conservative. You know, activists versus non-activists. Now, I can clearly say that I have never seen more activism or, or, or failure to be a strict constructionist than when there were some criminal defendants that had a very worthy claim. And if you had applied strict construction, which is what I applied, I, they would, that conviction would be reversed. But a lot of judges don't like to reverse criminal, defiction, criminal convictions, and there were cases that were not reversed. Am I talking about all of them? No, I'm not. But I'm certainly saying that I saw signs, had times, and you could go back and look at some of my dissents and say that I said that those very words. And I had some Republican counterparts that said it too. The Supreme Court reached in and plucked cases out. I mean, totally posture-wise, it was not appropriate for it to be in front of the Supreme Court. But yet it was. And that fellow Republicans would say against their fellow Republicans that this is the simple, the most activist act of a court ever. Because procedurally, as far as the posture, this case, this shouldn't be here. So they, but they would say, it's just, it's, judges ought to know uh, whether you're conservative or liberal, whether you're a God-fearing person or not, you know. They, they think that that's important. Um, I think it does great damage to the judiciary and to our law as well. Yes, sir. Uh, you're aware that your, your house got firebombed? If that's not too personal, can you talk a little bit about that? I mentioned that. I spoke to um, um, Emory Law School last week or the week before, and uh, somebody said, I really want to know about that <laughs> if we've got time. Um, when, in 1989, um, I had a, got a call. I was actually at a funeral of my uncle and received a phone call from my brother that he was standing in my house along with the volunteer fire department of Evergreen, and that someone had thrown a Molotov cocktail into my house. It's a very sobering thing to 
stand outside your house that it was saved because I had neighbors that were walking late at night and were under a sprinkler several houses up and saw the explosion. And they ran and knocked on a door and said, call the fire department, call the fire department. And they went and found my garden hose where I'd been watering plants and helped greatly diminish the damage to my home. Uh, so the next day, I'm with the Alabama Bureau of Investigation, the, um, the Alabama Tobacco Firearms, ATA. I'm with uh, numbers of other law enforcement, just a whole group of law enforcement, trying to think of all the people that would want to do me harm. This person was not on the list, the person that we ultimately believe did it, but we weren't able to convict him. We had some evidence, but, you know, after a volunteer fire department comes to your house to put out a fire, guess what? It's really hard to find evidence. <laughs> so um, we weren't able to convict him, but when we finally realized really who we, and I still truly believe this is who the per, it was somebody that had painted a painting of me. I had taken a step, his stepson away from him because he had beaten him horribly, thrown him in a ditch, told him he was going to get gasoline to come back and burn him. He'd been out in the woods for four days and four nights, and finally an aunt and uncle out in the country, I'm talking about way out in the country, um, very rural area, came to me, and I, I referred them to DHR, and they just said, I know that our house may be burned, but we can't, we can't sleep at night knowing he's outside. And so they took him in, and then they got, I gave them custody, and actually it wasn't even opposed by this other guy named Wesley Alexander. And then he painted a painting of me and s sent it to me, and then after he saw an announcement that I had um, gotten married, he comes in and storms into my secretary and demands to know why she's keeping um, me from him. That, and then he goes into details of some um, relationship that, of course, we had not had. It was simply, you know, in his mind, he became fixated on me. He was ultimately, I won't go through all the details because it would take too long, but ultimately uh, he burst into a, a meeting when he was put on probation um, for his child abuse incident because the child didn't want to testify, so they put him on probation. And then when he found out he wasn't supposed to have firearms and that he was supposed to go to mental health, he burst into a meeting of law enforcement and said, I, don't, I can tell you one thing, I'm going to keep my gun. I'm go not going to that crazy people's place, and I'm going to get even with those who have hurt me. So he was put into a mental hospital, and after he stayed uh, for a period of time, I get a phone call, Judge, Judge Cobb, um, we're about to let Wesley Alexander out, and as long as he's on his anti-fixational medicine, he's much less fixated on you. Great. <laughs> Thanks. So I tell people that there are many times that I felt much safer uh, as an appellate court judge than I did, and I think it's really true, than local judges. Because you deal with people that are not mentally stable, they've got drug and alcohol issues, that's who you deal with. That's who you deal with. You deal with people that have got problems, and uh, which is why we need more money in government to provide for security uh, for judges and litigants. Uh, and, and more mental health services, uh, more substance and uh, abuse. We've got to actually help people understand that we've got to fund government so that we can have a civilized society where we'll be safe and we'll flourish. We all, I know we're getting to the end. Um, I cannot tell you how, how wonderful this has been, uh, being with each and every one of you. I just want to quickly close with a story if I've got you. I think I can have two more minutes, two more minutes. When I was running for Chief Justice, I, um, my, several months before the election, my father, who was a major league cheerleader for me, both my parents were, my parents filled the well that a child can drink from forever. And um, when I was running that um, March of 2006, and things were, these wonderful things were about to come out, these mail, sli these slick mail ads that I didn't have the money to respond to, the ads, you know, should the 
um, race for the Supreme Court be about a slick PR campaign or a cane about, campaign about the issues, you know, things of that nature. I get a phone call, and my father had had a terrible, terrible stroke. And um, he wasn't able to see me come to the victory party, but he was able to see on the TV that I was elected. He wasn't able to come to my investiture, but he knew his, quote, his hun had made, made it to the big time. When I was Chief Justice about four and a half months, he had that last terrible stroke, and he was taken from us. And believe me, he wanted to go, because he was no longer living the life that he loved to live. That next day, uh, when we were assembling to go to the funeral home, my, uh, there was a knock at the door, and it was someone we'd known forever. His name was Gilbert Harden. He was the mailman. And he not just gave us our mail. What he did was he said, Oh, please let me do something. Your dad meant so much to us. Please let me do something. I said, Gilbert, we don't know what it would be. Thank you so much. And he said, you just don't know how much I'm going to miss Big O. You just don't know, Miss Thera, my mother. I want to do something to help y'all. And she said, I just don't know what that would be, Gilbert, but thank you so much. She said, again, to him, we just appreciate you being here. He said to her and to us, as I walked up to your parents, to your dad's door, I noticed that there were limbs, there were sticks in the yard. At the end of my shift today, can I come and pick up the sticks? At 3.30, when we looked up, Gilbert Harden was out in my daddy's yard picking up the sticks. And y'all, I tell y'all that for a reason. It's really twofold. One is that Gilbert Harden didn't just say thank you. Thank you. Thanked my dad for the fact that he would never been out in the woods and learned how to hunt because his daddy had to work on Saturdays. And my daddy took him hunting, and taught him he and his little brother how to hunt. He didn't just say it, he showed it, which is a lesson to y'all and to us that unexpressed gratitude is no gratitude at all. But the second reason I, I share it with you is, is really as a challenge to myself and to each of you that we live our lives in such a way that when our end comes, somebody's going to come come to our house and pick up the sticks. Thank y'all so much. Y'all been a dream. Thank you.